the diagram you see is a U-shaped structure with side A and side B, and in the middle is a structure with uh, peripherals, uh, perforated edges within. We have solutes and solvent, or in this case, water. So take a moment and answer questions one, two, three, and four. At this time, you need to pause the video and answer questions one through four. Okay, now that you've paused the video, what does what should we expect to find? In the U-tube U-shaped structure in the middle C, this diagram or portion C here, we can see that that is uh, actually a selectively permeable membrane with the solute molecules uh, not being able to pass through the membrane. As you can see, they're far too small. But the water solvent molecules are allowed to pass through the membrane. And in doing so, we see a net movement of water from side A to side B. So take a moment now and explain your results based on the diagram you see. Here again we have more cells and we see that these cells uh, all have the same concentration uh, within their beakers. Each one is 0.5%. And now this becomes important because we're looking at concentration of a solution. This is 0.5%, and we're going to say this is 0.5% sugar, which means then the remaining portion of that is actually out of the 100% possible 0.5% sugar, that makes the remaining portion 99.5% water. The environment, it says, is 3.5% sugar, which makes the remaining portion 96.5% water. So ask yourself, how will water move in this cell environment? And hopefully your answer that you've given is that the water will actually move from outside the cell, or from within the cell to the outward environment. Because we see that we have a 99% versus 96%. So water will always move from high concentration to low concentration. If you're asking yourself, why does the solute not pass through? We recognize that the sugar in this case is impermeable to the membrane. When you've done that, uh, when, if you recognize that, then take a moment and predict what's going to happen with beakers B and beakers uh, 2 and beaker 3. Pause the video to do that at this time. Once you've done that, you recognize then that we're actually dealing not so much with solvent or solute, but in this situation, solvent. We've made a critical change from going from so going, going from the solute, such as sugar or salt, and now we're dealing with the solvent it's dissolved in. In this case, it's water. And so our transition is moving from diffusion now to describing osmosis. Take a moment, write down the definition of, of osmosis, taking extra note that osmosis is really working with a special class of diffusion, working with water specifically, and requiring the presence of a selectively permeable membrane. Osmosis actually follows three different patterns. We can see, sorry, let me catch up here. We can see three different conditions for osmosis. The first two uh, are called, and these are easily confused, hypotonic and then hypertonic. And the distinction between these two is that the hypotonic, hypo meaning lower, indicates that it has a lower amount of solutes. And because it's lower, it has a higher concentration of water. Hypertonic, this term hyper, indicates a higher amount of solutes. So as we look back at our cells, we can begin designating this description of hypo versus hypertonic conditions. If we place, consider having a membrane in between the hypotonic and hypertonic solutions, then we can return back to our cell and recognize that here we have a cell at 0.5% solute. And this one is... 3.5% solute. The hypotonic solution must be inside because it's a lower concentration. So we're going to go ahead and label this hypo. And the external environment, therefore, in comparison, is hyper. As we look at the same cell uh, but different environment in sample 3, we see water is moving in. And this out, because it has a higher concentration inside, that would represent a hypertonic, and the external portion must be hypotonic. And we recognize now that in both situations, 
water is moving from hypo to hyper. As we see here, from hypo to hyper. And so the easiest way to remember which is which is to simply identify which direction is water traveling, and then just remember that water always moves from a hypotonic solution to a hypertonic solution. And as we do so, we also recognize though that cell or beaker number two has a has an equal environment on both sides. We have a term for that too. We're going to describe that as isotonic. In isotonic situations, we see waters moving in both directions at the same rate. So isotonic is equal on both sides. So if you think you understand this and can deal with those terms, then I want you to take a moment and consider this particular cell. Here we have the same, a cell with 30% sucrose, 20% glucose, with an environment of 10% sucrose, glucose, and fructose, respectively. And the, and the, the paragraph up above tells us that the membrane of the cell is permeable, so it allows water, fructose, and glucose to pass through, but is not permeable to sucrose. So take a moment in your notes, in your diagram, I want you to draw this cell and include the concentrations of, of what's involved, and then identify the direction of osmosis and diffusion. Draw that in. Then identify which, which solution is hypotonic and which is hypertonic in comparison to each side of the cell membrane. And finally, identify which solute diffuses into and which diffuses out of the cells. A couple extension questions just to get you really worked up. You may have noticed then that diffusion and osmosis can be operating at the same time and curiously in opposite directions. Explain why that might be. If you need an extra challenge, try to rearrange this cell diagram uh, to, I, to build a situation where osmosis and diffusion are happening in the same direction. Hopefully at the end of this video you can now define and describe osmosis and identify the three different conditions in which osmosis takes place.